Yeah, thanks all uh, for all you coming here tonight. I'm surprised that uh, this topic is interesting to people other than me. Uh, the yeah, I worked in the semiconductor industry for uh, over 40 years. 26 of it at uh, over 26 at uh, Texas Instruments, and I still marvel at the stuff that scientists and engineers were able to come up with. Uh, the stuff they came up with so radically changed our lives and the world. Uh, to me, it still borders on the uh, miraculous. Uh, to me, a lot of the stuff, and I know, I was there, we did it, you know. It, okay, yeah. Uh, to me, it shouldn't work, but it does. Uh, integrated circuit chip, size of your thumbnail, can have a billion transistors on it, electrical switches. Uh, <clears throat> those are the type of uh, uh, integrated circuits that run your cell phones and laptops. The switches are connected by wires a thousand times smaller than human hair. Come on. Uh, some of the transistors switch on and off a billion times a second, and they'll switch on and off for years and years and years and keep working. To me, that is just mind boggling. Com my common sense says it shouldn't work, but it does. And uh, today I hope to go over and explain to you how we make these uh, type of uh, integrated circuits with that many small electrical switches on it. Uh, I worked for Texas Instruments for over 26 years. I started as a thin film deposition and etch engineer and uh, later became manager of a group of engineers and technicians that developed manufacturing flows that actually built the ICs. And as a manager, I didn't have to do the work. I got to look over their shoulders and see what they were doing and marvel at the stuff that they came up with and built. I wrote a book on it, uh, uh, How Transistor Area Shrank by a, a Million Fold, uh, that I'll have some copies afterwards. My plan was to present portions of the book and show you how ICs were made, uh, plus give a few examples of processes and equipment that I really find amazing. Uh, but then uh, I was talking to uh, uh, Tom Keenan and, and uh, he was telling me about uh, some of the things that his father told me about the early days at TI and that, uh, before my time and that. And uh, uh, so I started looking into the history of TI and the history of the integrated circuit and uh, it literally blew me away. I had no idea. I had no idea how incredibly unique the semiconductor industry is. And so I'm gonna give just a brief introduction to give you just a couple of highlights <clears throat> of that. And I also didn't know that the company, uh, Texas Instruments, that I spent most of my professional career at is a company that's primarily responsible for jump-starting the semiconductor revolution. The birthplace of the semiconductor revolution that so raised the standard of living of the whole world started just a few miles south of here in 75 in North Dallas. <coughs> and I'll just tell you a bit why I say that uh, uh, too. Uh, so I, at the beginning of my talk, I added just a couple of uh, short uh, uh, additions to uh, describe this uh, uh, to you. Uh, so the outline, uh, a brief overview of the semiconductor industry, why I think it's so unique, briefly describe <coughs> how Texas Instruments started the semiconductor revolution, and then I'll go into and describe in MOS transistor switches, how they work and how we build them uh, briefly describe the constant stream of inventions that occurred year after year after year in order to keep the IC uh, 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 circuit shrinking and present a few <coughs> examples of what I thought the, uh, or uh, when I thought transistor shrinking was uh, stopping only to have some group of scientists come out of left field and uh, pull a rabbit out of the hat and uh, keep it going. Uh, there is so much, I'm just hitting the tops of the iceberg, there's so much here that uh, could be covered. Uh, I had prepared <coughs> a bunch more slides about TI 
and what, how TI went from such a small company to big. There's a lot of interesting stories there, but that's going to have to happen uh, some other time because uh, there's just too much. Uh, the, uh, <coughs> but in case you're wondering why do we need IC chips with billions of transistors that switch so darn fast, I'll just describe briefly uh, FaceTime uh, uh, to give you an idea. It took until 2004 for cell phone chips to finally have enough transistors on them and be fast enough so that they could do FaceTime. Our smartphone camera takes about 30 pictures per second and each picture is composed of over a million uh, uh, points called uh, pixels. Uh, you can see across the top of the screen, there's 828 pixels and vertically uh, seven, over 1,700 pixels. So there's almost a million and a half uh, pixels to make up that picture on your cell phone. And your cell phone takes 30 pictures of those uh, a second. It then your cell phone chip converts each pixel to a binary number that specifies the pixel's color and brightness. So it's doing that to all million and a half pixels. It sends these binary numbers to your friend's cell phone. And uh, so you're seeing, you know, it's sending over uh, 30 million of these things a second. That's why you need such a fast transistors and stuff. Your cell phone captures those binary numbers, converts them uh, back to the color and uh, brightness, reconstructs the picture frame and projects, projects them on your friend's cell phone screen. At the same time, all this stuff is going on with the pictures. It's taking the sound, converting the sound into <clears throat> binary numbers, sending the sound uh, to your friend's phone. And uh, so your, your friend's phone captures both the pictures and the sound, uh, converts the uh, the sound pixels and the picture pixels back to pictures and voice. And it's doing this so fast that when you look at FaceTime, it looks like it's real time. You don't see that uh, it's digital at all. Uh, semiconductor revolution just generated trillions of dollars uh, that fueled uh, not only the growth of the uh, of the semiconductor industry, but many spin-off industries. Standard of living across the whole world uh, just uh, went way up. Even people in remote areas have televisions and cell phones. And uh, thousands of new businesses, thousands of new products, telephones advanced from landlines to pagers to cell phones and then to smartphones in just a matter of a couple decades. Uh, Cameras advanced from film cameras and film movie cameras to digital still cameras and digital movie cameras to digital cell phone cameras uh, that also take movies. Most people now, when they go on their vacation, they don't even bother about a, a, a camera or a movie camera. They just take their cell phones. The, the uh, uh, cameras on cell phones are just so good uh, these days that you don't need the other ones. Uh, most appliances, tools, automobiles are run by microcontrollers. Uh, TI was uh, first uh, developed the first single chip microcontroller. Uh, TVs change from bulky cathode gray tubes with limited screen size to <clears throat> the, that sat on TV stands now to lightweight large flat panel TVs that hang on the wall. And ICs enabled the uh, invention of life-changing medical equipment, such uh, as, as Tom mentioned, like MRIs, CAT scans, ultrasound, implanted pacemakers, non-contact temperature set, and on and on and on. And there's so many more. I mean, we could go on forever. It's just uh, endless. So how is the semiconductor industry unique? I believe the semiconductor industry is unique because it was started by brilliant scientists and engineers who also were brilliant uh, businessmen. And in my uh, uh, experience, uh, tech nerds aren't often really good businessmen, but uh, they're darn good tech nerds. Um, this, this just shows the leaders of like Texas Instruments, the main big companies, Bell Labs, Fairchild, and Intel, IBM, they're all technical degreed people. Cutting edge semiconductor R&D is crazy expensive. Thousands of professors and PhDs 
and grad students uh, left academia to go to semiconductor companies and research labs where they could do cutting edge research funded by the influx of the hundreds of millions of dollars uh, from semiconductors. They went to places like TI, Fairchild, Intel, Motorola, IBM, uh, Semitech, IMACLAT. The scientists and engineers that I worked with at TI were not at all driven by money. Their main focus was uh, keeping Moore's Law on track and designing ICs with new cool functions that were made possible with the new technologies that they were developing. The enormous wealth that their uh, work generated wasn't their uh, main focus. It was just a convenient byproduct that funded the work that they enjoyed doing. Uh, in 1965, Gordon Moore, a PhD chemist and co-founder of Intel, made a comment based on his observations that the density of transistors and integrated circuits would probably continue to double every couple years <clears throat> with very little increase in cost. This statement became known as Moore's Law. For some unknown reason, I'd really like to know, if anybody does know, tell me, uh, the technical leaders of the giant semiconductor companies took Moore's Law on a, as a challenge and turned it into their business model. To me, that was just plain crazy. I, I, I can't imagine uh, any business person doing that sort of thing. When they adopted that business model, these high-tech companies signed up to push existing equipment and processes to the very limit and make the highest performance integrated circuits possible. And then, in just two years' time, invent and develop new equipment and new processes that could make ICs with double the transistor density. That's just crazy. The gamble they took was huge. There was no guarantee that uh, new processes and uh, machines could be invented, developed, and made manufacturable that quickly. They had monumental, man, monumental faith that the technical community could figure it out and uh, would deliver to the new technologies to that crazy schedule that they had promised. Amazingly, those high rollers were dealt winning hands again and again. New techniques were con consistently delivered on schedule about every two years, and year after year, huge profits continued to roll in, and year after year, Moore's Law pretty much stayed on track. Texas Instruments, uh, the Little North Company that, in my opinion, jump-started the semiconductor revolution. Most of what I'll be talking about I got out of these books I'm uh, showing here. Oop, sorry. Uh, showing here the three books, Dodging Elephants and the uh, Transistor, that were written by TIers that uh, uh, retired. And then Crystal Fire is another book that's written by uh, a professor from Stanford and a professor from the University of Illinois. Uh, so the, I had uh, to the talk a lot of stuff of what TI did too, but that's going to have to wait for another time. There's just too many uh, stories and too much stuff there. Sorry. So why do I think Texas Instrument started the semiconductor revolution? Now, well, TI excelled almost from the start in manufacturing technology. TI's high-yielding, low-cost manufacturing flows <coughs> enabled TI to quickly drive the price of uh, transistors down, making competition challenging. The big companies, uh, technical companies at the time, like AT&T, Raytheon, Sylvia, or I mean Sylvania, GE, uh, I can't read the other, Motorola, uh, they all had profitable businesses manufacturing uh, vacuum tubes. Well, TI didn't have any vacuum tube business. They, if they made transistors, they had to make a profit by selling uh, transistors. So TI had great motivation to go out and create markets uh, for their transistors so that they could sell them. Uh, it turned out, TI was able to sell, even early on with the germanium transistors, was able to sell them at good prices. And uh, other companies often bought 
uh, the transistors from TI because they could buy them cheaper from TI than they could make them themselves. Uh, IBM soon signed up, uh, signed a multi-year contract with uh, TI uh, to buy tens of thousands of transistors every year to put in their uh, transistorized uh, computers. In uh, 1954, TI invented the first commercial silicon transistor and for the next year, four years, TI was the only company that knew how to manufacture uh, silicon transistors. They kept that secret pretty good. Uh, germanium transistors are only good to 70 degrees, whereas silicon transistors are good up to 150 degrees. And because of this, uh, the military, space, and consumer markets really wanted the uh, 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 silicon transistors. They were in high demand. Um, by offering affordable silicon transistors, the silicon transistor market just exploded. And as the market for silicon transistors exploded, or rapidly expanded, so did TI. In the 50s, TI grew from a small semiconductor company to a very large semiconductor company and then the largest semiconductor uh, company in the world in a very short space of time. To meet the demand for high purity silicon critical for making uh, the silicon uh, transistor, TI invented a new process for high purity silicon and started manufacturing high purity silicon and also uh, silicon wafers. At the time, DuPont was the main supplier of high purity silicon and they were selling it for $500 a pound. And uh, TI just didn't want to spend that money uh, and uh, have their transistors be that expensive. So they invented their own method, uh, a cheaper, better way of making high purity silicon. And, uh, and when one of the raw materials to making the high purity silicon ran in short supply, they went out and invented a way to make the uh, 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 raw material to make high purity silicon. And then TI uh, became, in addition to a uh, uh, transistor company, a chemical company. And uh, TI started making tons of uh, high purity silicon and thousands of uh, high purity silicon wafers. Uh, and uh, TI supplied the silicon market uh, semiconductor market early on uh, with these high purity silicon and uh, it was the main supplier of high purity silicon. This I think as much as anything uh, give, uh, is why uh, TI is responsible or the main force behind the silicon uh, uh, revolution. At its peak TI was uh, making and selling 3.2 million wafers a year. So during the 50s, TI grew from a small semiconductor co company to the world's largest semiconductor company, and it stayed on top throughout the 60s and 70s. And uh, uh, TI to this day still remains one of the top 10 se uh, semiconductor ma manufacturers. Now, the other thing that TI did that uh, <coughs> really revolutionized things was the invention of the uh, integrated circuit uh, by Jack Kilby uh, at TI. And uh, I went to Wiki and, and uh, just typed in, uh, 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 Googled and Bing, you know, uh, who invented the integrated circuit? I was shocked. Uh, couldn't believe what I got. Here's what uh, you ask Bing. And what comes up? Just this. It says Robert Noyce invented the monolithic integrated circuit. And uh, I'm sorry I'm going on a bit of a tangent here, but okay. <laughs> but but and 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 the and a quote here's the quote from Google. It says there is no consensus on who invented the integrated circuit. It could be Noyce, Horney. Uh, uh, Kilby, and there was another name and said, or it could be, uh, they should be co-inventors, that kind of thing like that. Oh, shit. Oops, sorry. Uh, but, but if you look, on July 28, uh, 1958, Jack Kilby wrote in his notebook, 
extreme miniaturization of electrical circuits could be achieved by making resistors, capacitors, transistors, and diodes on a single slice of silicon. That is an integrated circuit. I mean, come on. And, and uh, well, in, in uh, Wiki, if you look places, they downplay Jack's invention because he said, ah, oh, he did it in germanium. And silicon is the way it's really done. And, uh, uh, but if we go back and look uh, what the thinking was back in 1958 when uh, Jack made this statement, in 58, experts thought that single crystal silicon was too valuable to waste on resistors, capacitors, and diodes. The main focus of miniaturization in 58 was the Army's micromodule approach where they would make transistors, all, all these different components on separate pieces of silicon that were all shaped the same size and then wire all the separate pieces of silicon together. That was a focus. That's where, that was the, uh, where everyone was going for miniaturization at that time. Uh, and the expert thinking in 58 was that transistor to transistor variability was so great that a multi-transistor ICs just would never yield. And that, so what Jack did is on uh, September 12 and 58, he demonstrated a two transistor phase shift oscillator IC, uh, IC on a single piece of uh, crystal ger germanium because at the time germanium was more handy than silicon at TI. And then just a week later, he demonstrated a two transistor flip-flop integrated circle, circuit also on germanium. Now, Kilby's invention in integrated circuit demos, they were revolutionary. He proved that the expert thinking at the time was incorrect, was just plain wrong. Jack Kilby's IC came to be known as the hybrid IC because he wired the components on his ITCs together using wire bonds, filled wire bonds. Six months later, Robert Noyce at Fairchild invented what came to be known as a monolithic IC. He wired the components on his ICs together using the planar silicon process where you deposit dielectric, then deposit metal pattern and etch the metal wires to uh, connect the ICs together. Uh, this is my opinion is that uh, uh, Kilby invented the integrated circuit and Robert Noyce invented a, way, a better way of manufacturing the integrated circuit. I could be wrong, but that's what it looks like to me. I think what happened is that there was just so much licensing money riding on who owned the IC patent that the, huh? I, I think that, that they ended up, uh, the lawyers got involved and started wordsmithing things and invented a hybrid IC and monolithic IC and said they're two different types of ICs, so they're different inventions. And uh, uh, so they ended up, uh, uh, saying joint invention of two different ICs could be claimed, and so integrated circuit licensing fees uh, could be collected by both TI and Fairchild. I don't know if that's right, but uh, that's kind of what it looks like uh, to me. But if that's true, then I'm very disappointed in the TI uh, 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 patent attorneys who let Fairchild get away with that. I could be wrong, but... Uh, ICs today are, Robert Noyce's planar process is the way mo most uh, ICs are, are manufactured today. Uh, just one other thing I'd like to cover that uh, I, I was surprised to find out that uh, people I worked with uh, at TI and that uh, uh, didn't know about, but in uh, 1993, Texas Instruments totally revolutionized the semiconductor industry and how we make uh, uh, integrated circuits. Uh, in 1998, that's 10 years before these 12 inch wafers were, were oops, sorry, expected to come out. Uh, the government agencies, ARPA and the Air Force awarded TI an 80 plus million dollar contract to invent and develop new manufacturing technologies capable of manufacturing ICs and 12 inch wafers. Uh, it was the, the current, sorry, the current process at the time uh, was, was batch processes um, shown in the, up here. You take a, uh, 
uh, a boat and, and load these uh, silicon wafers, many silicon wafers, dozens and dozens, into the boat and then shove them into this furnace tube. And in that furnace tube, you deposit the uh, film like polysilicon, oxide, nitrate, whatever, uh, deposit it on these uh, uh, wafers. And they could do it uniformly, get a uniform form, a uh, uniform film across those wafers uh, when they were six inch and eight inch. But it was clear when 12 inch came, there was no way it was possible to do that anymore. You needed a new technology. So the government funded TI over 10 years ahead of time to figure out how are we going to do this. And they gave TI over $80 million to do that. Well, from 1990 to 1993, a team of scientists and engineers uh, led by uh, uh, Bob Doring, uh, actually at Texas Instruments, uh, ran this MMST program, and they invented dozens and dozens of tools and processes uh, that uniformly deposited film, uh, thin films across one wafer at a time, uniformly etched thin films uniformly one wafer at a time, and annealed dopants uniformly one wafer at a time. Uh, yeah, this just compares uh, process flows. The uh, one on the uh, left here is uh, what the factory looked like, a TI factory looked like in 1993, where you can see all these processes here are done in furnace tubes in the batch. The process that these guys invented at TI in 1993 looks like this, where most of these processes are now single wafer tubes. If you go in the factory today and look at what the process, what the factory looks like, how you're manufacturing wafers, it's going to look very much like the uh, process that these guys invented. So anyway, in the uh, first quarter of 93, uh, that MMST team processed 1,000 double level metal wafers on the 0.35 micron CMOS process using their newly developed single wafer manufacturing line. They actually processed several wafers from start to finish in three days. That amazes me still. That's a world record that's never been uh, equaled uh, that I know of. Typical cycle time to process a wafer from beginning to end uh, using the branch process was on the order of about two months. They did it three days. Uh, the government uh, MMST uh, contract stipulated that because technology was developed with taxpayers' money, the technology had to be made available to all the uh, semiconductor companies. A group of T uh, TI engineers who worked on the MMST program proposed to split from TI and start a new company manufacturing these new single wafer tools. That would have been a good deal. I was talking to them at the time and hoping I could go with them, but that never happened. Uh, instead, to avoid a conflict of interest <clears throat> with TI's competitors, TI bundled those patents all together and sold them to Applied Materials, which was already an established semiconductor manufacturing company. The original versions of many of the single wafer tools that Applied Materials now uh, uses are based on that single wafer technology that TI uh, developed. And Applied Materials uh, uh, is the largest semiconductor uh, manufacturer of equipment in the world, I think, today. Is that right, Patrick? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, God. Thank you, you sure? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Here, here's another interesting project that happened at TI. There's so many more, but I just picked out two that happened to uh, strike me. In uh, uh, 1991, I was at TI at the time. I had no clue that uh, this was going on at TI. I only heard about it long after the fact. I heard uh, about uh, some of the engineers, I think over in the, in the, uh, uh, the SC building and stuff, they didn't go home for days. They slept under their desks. They slept because they were working on this project. But anyway, Operation Desert Storm started on the 15th of January, 1997. Iraq had hardened bunkers that were deep underground that our munitions just could not penetrate. 
So in late December of 97, the U.S. Air Force approached Lockheed and Texas Instruments and asked them to start a, a, a rush program to develop a bunker buster bomb that could reach these deep underground uh, bunkers. They started the uh, whole project just on a handshake. Uh, there were no written specifications, nothing written down. They just took off and did it. That is like what Tom was saying about how dedicated uh, TI uh, uh, was. Um, <coughs> on January 25, Lockheed started repurposing surplus 18 long 8-inch howitzer barrels uh, to contain the explosive. On uh, uh, 13th of February, they said they'd uh, send two uh, test rounds and two live rounds. Um, the project officially started the 14th of February. TI built some models and, and uh, what TI was, uh, so Lockheed was gonna uh, supply the bomb itself and TI was supplying the guidance system that would, uh, because they were releasing this bomb from, uh, 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 I don't know, 30 plus thousand feet, 30, 40,000 feet up, and uh, it had to be guided uh, down to the target, and TI was designing the guidance system for that. Um, <clears throat> on February 24, the first bunker buster bomb uh, guided by TI's new guidance system uh, was dropped over the New Mexico desert. It hit target and buried itself 100 feet down. Uh, success on uh, February 6, a bunch of brave men hand poured hundreds of pounds of hot explosive to fill those casings. And while that hot explosive was still cooling, two bombs were uh, flown 17 hours over to uh, Saudi Arabia with five hours of landing. They were under the wings of F-11. And that very night, they were uh, dropped. One of the bombs hit the bullseye and uh, busted the bu bunker. Uh, in the story about it that I read, they said uh, uh, they dropped it and they looked, they didn't see anything, nothing happened for a couple minutes, and then the smoke started pouring out of the vents so they knew that they had been successful. Next day, uh, Iraq called for a C4, uh, fire, uh, ceasefire. There's a lot of other uh, stories that'd be interesting, but uh, you know, maybe some other time. And that, okay. Uh, get to uh, semiconductors and how, how we actually make semiconductors. Uh, so on a silicon wafer, we make these uh, integrated circuits. Each square is an integrated circuit. You cut, it, cut out the integrated circuit. Around the integrated circuit are these uh, bond pads uh, where signals go in and out to the integrated circle. Take that... Uh, uh, integrated circuit mounted on top of a lead frame and then run gold wires from each of these uh, uh, bond pads to a different lead on the lead frame. And then encapsulate that all in a plastic like this. So inside is the integrated circuit and each one of these metal tabs out here uh, goes to a different uh, um, signal lead. And you can mount these in uh, you know, on circuit boards. Uh, so this is an integrated circuit. This is a, a SEM, a, a high resolution a micrograph of a real circuit that we sliced through and took a picture of. This is kind of a cartoon uh, showing how they're built. We have the wafer down here. In the wafer, we have uh, it's called shallow trench isolation, digging trenches in here and fill them up with uh, insulator dielectric uh, to uh, isolate this transistor from this transistor. After we do that, we then build the transistor gates uh, on here and then put down a dielectric layer, pattern it, cut holes down in it, fill the holes with uh, tungsten, so we have electrical contact between the source and drain of these transistors and uh, the next level of metal up. And here, another dielectric put down pattern, etch uh, 
trenches into it, fill those trenches with metal, and just keep going again and again and again on, on up. Uh, there are some integrated circuits where you do this uh, 20 layers. Okay, just <clears throat> briefly, uh, a carbon atom has four bonding electrons around it. Uh, silicon also has four bonding electrons around it. In a diamond, uh, carbon is surrounded by four other carbon atoms, and each carbon atom shares two electrons between them. This is called a covalent bond. In uh, diamond, these bonds are really strong. If you put a battery across the diamond, nothing happens, no current at all. However, the bonds are not as strong in a silicon crystal. Some of the bonds, even at room temperature, are broken, and there's loose electrons running around uh, in the silicon crystal. If you put a battery across this, you'll get a small leakage current uh, going. That's why they call it a semiconductor. It's not a conductor. It's not an insulator semiconductor. Now, you can make silicon really conductive if you want to in two ways. If you take out some of these silicon atoms out of the uh, crystal and replace them with phosphorus atoms. Now, phosphorus atom is four bonding electrons out. So if you stick these phosphorus atoms in here, you end up having an electron, an extra electron that's running around here. And uh, put a battery across here and it conducts electri uh, electric very well. You know, the heavier you dope it, the more phosphorus atoms you put in, on the lower the resistance of the silicon. Uh, the other way you can uh, make silicon conductive is by replacing the silicon atom with a boron atom. Boron only has three electrons around the outside, so when you stick boron atoms into the silicon, when you replace silicon atoms in the lattice with boron atoms, there are missing, electron, uh, missing electrons, and those act like positive charges. If you put a, and you can make the electra, the uh, uh, single crystal silicon very conductive by doping it heavily with boron. If you put a battery across the boron, like the electron from this bond will hop over into this on, and this uh, positive hole will move over here. And then this electron will hop over and the hole moves over. So the holes move in one direction and electrons in another. And so you can have P-type, which is, uh, I mean, you can have this uh, N-type silicon N because negative uh, electrons carry the charge. And you can have P-type silicon because these positive holes carry the charge. Now, <clears throat> if you stick uh, P-type silicon against N-type silicon, put them together, you get what's called a PN junction. And PN junctions are kind of cool because if you hook a battery across the PN junction, you can forward bias it where you put the positive side of the battery against the P-type silicon, negative side of the battery against the N-type silicon, and Electric, well, electricity will just flow through this thing until the battery runs dead. Uh, that's what's uh, uh, neat about a diode. The electricity flows in one direction, but not in the other direction. If you reverse the pol polarity on the battery on here and put it on, no current flow at all. Okay, why did I tell you that? Okay, that's, now we can see how a, a transistor works. This is an MOS transistor. <coughs> MOS transistor, it, MOS comes from the uh, original, originally you had a metal gate and then an insulator or oxide, uh, at the time was oxide, and then substrate. And uh, so that's where uh, MOS comes from, metal, oxide, substrate. But anyway, here, if you look uh, on the left side, the transistor is off. Here we have a PN junction. Here we have the positive voltage on the N-type dopant. It's reverse bias, no current flows. Uh, so this transistor is off. <coughs> now what's cool about the uh, these transistors, you can uh, put a positive voltage on the gate. Well, well, negative charges are attracted to the positive voltage, so negative 
loose negative charges in the substrate get pulled up underneath uh, this insulator, underneath the gate oxide. They would like to go, but the gate oxide prevents them. But they accumulate underneath because of the positive side on the vote. In fact, so many of them accumulate that they fill up all the holes that were there, and then excess electrons uh, pile up underneath that uh, 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 gate oxide. <coughs> and now there's more negative carriers there than there are uh, positive carriers, so that uh, you've turned the p-type n-type. Now you have n-type silicon, the electricity just flows freely uh, right from source to drain and the light turns on. Uh, if you take the voltage off the gate, there's nothing to hold those electrons underneath there. They diffuse away and they diffuse away re really quickly. You can turn this transistor on, on and off uh, millions of times a second. Here's a picture of a, a, a real picture of a real transistor where here you see the isolation uh, or the shallow trans isolation which, which uh, isolates this transistor here from the transistor uh, that you'd be next to it. Here you can see the gate uh, of the transistor and uh, these are the contact plugs, one uh, to the transistor source and one to the transistor drain. Uh, so we're going to go through and uh, just explain uh, how we build a transistor. <coughs> As before, it's kind of, uh, I mentioned it's layer by layer. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. Uh, the, the, um, this right here is a transistor OR gate, a logic gate. So uh, here we have the... Uh, uh, a source on either side of these two gates with a drain in the middle. And we're going to look for current on that drain. Well, we can get current on that drain if either this transistor turns on or this transistor turns on, or both of them. So it's, it's an OR logic. Uh, we can uh, look for either this turn, transistor turning on or that turn, uh, transistor turning on. So <clears throat> to build uh, transistors, we build them layer by layer. Typically, we put down a layer, a thin film on the wafer. It may be an insulator. It may be a conductor like dope, polysilicon, or metal. We then form a pattern on, the, uh, on that film. We deposit photoresist. That's a photoactive polymer <clears throat> where when light hits that polymer, it, uh, a chemical reaction undergoes, and it changes the, uh, where the light hits it. It changes it from being insoluble to soluble. Uh, so we project light uh, through our pattern, our photoresist, uh, our pattern or reticle, it's sometimes called. But wherever light hits the uh, photoresist, it, uh, the chemical reactions occur and make it soluble. So then we can take a developer solution and uh, wash away and where the uh, polymer was exposed, uh, the uh, photoresist goes away and we're left with this pattern on top of the wafers uh, where the uh, photoresist protects the uh, layer uh, where we want it protected. We can then etch the film, create reactive free radicals in a plasma. Uh, here I've shown uh, chlorine free radicals. These things are very reactive. And uh, wherever, like a, a film like, uh, uh, say, silicon, like the silicon substrate, or polysilicon, wherever it's exposed, the chlor chlorine atoms attack it and etch it away, and it uh, 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 forms a gas and gets uh, uh, pumped away. Um, <coughs> now, a plasma, we, we, we see plasmas, you know, every day and don't think about them, but uh, like a neon sign inside a neon sign, uh, it's a plasma where you have a neon gas and you run a current through it and the electric current goes through the uh, neon gas and forms the plasma, and it knocks electrons off uh, 
the uh, neon, uh, uh, forming a neon ion. The neon ion is very reactive, so it finds the nearest electron, grabs it, and uh, goes back from a neon ion to a neon molecule. When it does that, it gives off the neon light, and that's how we get neon light. But uh, inside the electricity running through the gas is a plasma. After we etch away the, and take away the uh, uh, film that we don't want, we then remove the uh, photoresist. So uh, this is just equipment used to uh, build ICs. We, uh, to put photoresist on the wafer, we have a dispense model that dispense a puddle of photoresist. This chuck then spins fast, and you end up with a very thin layer of photoresist across the wafer, very uniform. And then we stick the, uh, the uh, wafer on a chuck into this uh, uh, printer and uh, with light ex exposed through a photo mask, which is up here, and uh, uh, print the uh, pattern on the wafer. Uh, this just shows one of the uh, tools. Uh, this is a, a ASML uh, printer, which is, each of them costs upwards of $100 million. And I, I, quite a bit more than $100 million, some of them. Some of them are $150 million. And that, that's why uh, wafer fabs are so expensive. So we're going to quickly go through and build up this structure right here. Uh, the first thing we're going to do is work on the isolation part where we, we uh, put photoresist on, we pattern it, and uh, uh, form the pattern. Uh, we then etch the silicon, etch the holes in the, the silicon here, and fill them up with uh, uh, dielectric silicon dioxide. And then we use a procedure called chemical mechanical polish, where it's just like you sand it smooth, polish it smooth, and get rid of all this overburden of silicon dioxide and end up with the uh, uh, trenches just filled level full with the oxide. This is actual wafer where after we've etched the trenches into the silicon, deposit the silicon dioxide, and then uh, chemical mechanical polish where you can see that uh, you just have the trenches fill and all the overfill is gone. Uh, we then work on the next part where we put down the uh, gates, the transistor gates. We uh, uh, deposit uh, polysilicon. Uh, and then uh, form a, the gate photoresist pattern on the polysilicon, and again, use a plasma etch to etch away the polysilicon that we don't want, leaving just the gates and everything else is gone. Uh, now we need to put in the source and drains. These are, uh, uh, we need to dope the, uh, source and drain silicon next to these gates uh, end type. So on, uh, we put down a pattern to keep the uh, dopant from uh, uh, places we don't want it. And then we implant phosphorus into the uh, uh, silicon here next to the gates to form the source and drains of the gates to form the PN junctions next to the transistor. We uh, <clears throat> do this by, we take phosgene gas and in a plasma, uh, get rid of an electron and we form uh, phosphorus ions. And uh, next, we remove this pattern, cover up uh, these because we want to protect uh, the N-type doping and put P-type doping to make uh, real low resistance contact to the uh, substrate and we implant uh, boron. Um, this is a type of machine we use to do it, very expensive, multi-million dollar machine, where we generate the ions here and then accelerate them with a high electric field and uh, implant them uh, into the surface of the silicon. The ions are going near the speed of light when they crash into the surface. And when they crash into the surface, they do quite a bit of damage. Uh, on the surface and that. And because 
we have damage on the surface. And because we need, <coughs> uh, what we need to do is, is get these uh, ions that we've implanted into the surface, we need to activate them. They need to replace silicon atoms in the crystal or uh, they won't help at, at all. They don't work at all. So we need to heat the wafer uh, to about 900 degrees, and at 900 degrees, silicon atoms will come out and uh, the phosphorus or the boron atoms will replace the silicon atoms in the uh, crystal, and, that, and we use a rapid thermal uh, like that. So after we form the source drains and we form the substrate contact, we put down a layer of dielectric, we pattern the dielectric and form uh, contact holes through the dielectric, fill it up with the uh, tungsten, uh, CVD tungsten, and overfill it, and then use that chemical mechanical polish again to get rid of the excess uh, CVD tungsten. So now we have dielectric covering all the uh, integrated circuit, all the transistors and uh, electrical contact between the substrate contact and the source and drains uh, up above. We then put a layer of intermetal dielectric, another dielectric, cut trenches in the dielectric, pattern and action uh, cut trenches in, and then electroplate copper to fill up those trenches and overfill the trenches, CMP again, and uh, we end up with uh, uh, copper wires uh, wiring our integrated circuit together. And this is a somewhat simplified view of what actually happens, but this gives you an idea of how we build these things. And uh, we can build them really small because we're building all this stuff using uh, plasma and molecules and atoms and plasma and the molecules and atoms and stuff are really small. So they can get into really small areas. But uh, over the period of about oh, 40 years, 40 years, I guess it is, uh, like this gate was made a thousand times narrower, and this trench a thousand times narrower. So we ran into a lot of problems. <laughs> so how do uh, devices shrink? Uh, again, between 1972 and 2012, uh, Transistor gates link shrank about a thousand fold from 10 microns to uh, uh, 10 nanometers. So a thousand times smaller length times a thousand times smaller width equals a million times smaller area. Every four years, the geometry width we cut in half. Every two to three years, the number of transistors in a given area double. Uh, won't go over all this stuff, but it just shows that every node, we had to reinvent the transistor. Uh, things change so rapidly as we went from node to node uh, that uh, it was constant reinvention. Uh, like as these source drains here got closer together, uh, we started getting leakage between them. So we had to start putting sidewalls on to push them, keep them far enough apart so they didn't leak. Finally, the sidewalls got so large that we had to add extensions on these things so that we could still conduct electricity on it. And finally, the extensions got so close together, we had to add halo implants and that. But, and, and like uh, here, the gate got so narrow that the resistance of the polysilicon got too high. So we had to put a metal compound on top to cut down the resistance. Well, molysilicide is what we used first and it worked for a while. Uh, but then we had to switch to titanium silicide because that ran out of gas. Titanium silicide ran out of gas. We had to go to cobalt silicide on these nodes. That ran out of gas. So we're now using nickel silicide on these nodes. And here's a, other methods that we use when the transistors just weren't quite fast enough to meet uh, the uh, specifications that we're getting to keep up with Moore's Law. We had to do some really fancy stuff with the uh, different types of stress to try and get uh, pushed just a little more, get a little more gas out of these transistors and that. But it was just constant invention, every uh, almost every node. And the same way like on 
these trenches where these trenches got squeezed, came narrower and narrower. We couldn't make them up much shallower. They just kept getting narrow and narrow. And here's a trench when they were down and we started running into these problems time and again, where we could not fill up these trenches without leaving voids. And these voids were killers. They killed the circuit. You had to get rid of them. So you had to change the process. You had to change the equipment. You had to change the chemistry or something. And this just shows that we change the uh, chemistry many times uh, through the different uh, nodes in order. Oops, uh, sorry, I went to, uh, yeah, to get rid of these uh, uh, voids that we're getting here. And then the next level up in between the gates, uh, we had problems that we'd get voids between the gates here. And those were killer defects too. This is a top-down view of uh, where this is a contact and this is a contact. And these two contacts got filled with uh, CVD tungsten. Well, when we filled the, the contacts with tungsten, this little void here filled up with tungsten too. So we had a tungsten short between these two uh, contacts and the uh, circuit was killed. So we had to change again the uh, process that we used to uh, form dielectrics here. So, uh, Many times we ended up having to change things. And I won't go over this, but this is, uh, again, uh, the contacts. The contacts had to be changed many, many times in order to get these things uh, to work. So, uh, but the point I'm making is that in order to shrink these transistors, you know, by a thousand fold over a period of a couple of years, almost every node we had to have inventions that, to do things that hadn't been done before. And they had to invent processes and come up with new equipment. And you end up, uh, oftentimes we ended up uh, pulling out, uh, uh, you know, a multi-million dollar piece of equipment and setting it out on the back dock and moving one in that could get the job done. It was, uh, uh, it was an exciting time. <laughs> uh, lithography was incredible. Uh, as the geometries got smaller and smaller and they got near the wavelength of light, we had to uh, get smaller, uh, get to a smaller wavelength. And each, each time we got to smaller wavelength, we had needed new equipment and new processes. And, uh, uh, okay. Uh, a number of times I thought my job was done. I thought we, couldn't go any farther. Each time I was wrong, the uh, scientists and engineers pulled a rabbit out of the hat and got us past the back wall, and we kept on going. Uh, in the mid 80s, I happened to be in the uh, basement of the South uh, Building Fab talking to the uh, third shift uh, engineer, and she told me she had to print the gate and the uh, contact, which were the most sensitive uh, uh, levels with the smallest geometries on third shift uh, because during the day, trucks running by, by on uh, 635, which is about a half mile south of uh, the south building, uh, sent vibrations that uh, made the images blurry. And uh, I thought, huh, that's a killer. How in the dickens are we gonna print stuff on the next node when uh, we've already, when we've cut things down by that much? And uh, so I didn't know what we were gonna do, but what they did is they invented a vibration can canceling system that solved the problem. Their system senses vibrations and generates uh, counter vibrations that exactly cancel the incoming vibrations before the vibrations meet the photo printer. How cool is that? And it works great. In fact, it works so great that today photo printers just sit right on the factory floor and are protected from vibrations by this vibration canceling system. It's amazing. It works uh, really well. Same tech, uh, type of technology that's, uh, you know, kind of used in uh, noise canceling headphones. Uh, Dopant activation anneal is another one that, uh, you know, uh, really I think is uh, amazing. Uh, after you implant the source and drains, as I mentioned, you need to heat them to 900 degrees 
in order to activate the dopant. You need to get the dopant atoms to replace silicon atoms in the single crystal silicon. And you also need to heal the damage that uh, was caused by the implant. The problem is that the high temperature junctions diffuse closer together and you start getting leakage. These, ju these junctions uh, at high temperature start moving and they get closer together and you start getting uh, leakage. So we got to a point where things got so close together that the time at, that the wafers could be at 900 degrees had to be a minute or less. And that got to be really difficult. And I remember talking to people in the South Building who were working on this problem. And uh, when they heated the wafer to 900 degrees so quickly, just slight non-uniformity is in the wafer because the wafer expands quite a bit uh, going under uh, undergoing that big temperature day. But anyway, uh, for the, uh, you'd get these huge stresses that would just shatter the wafer. And uh, so for months they were shattering wafer after wafer, just turning them into a fine silicon dust. And that, and after, I don't know how much time, I don't remember, but it was a long time, you know, many months, you know, may have been even a year. They figured out, uh, and they finally got wafers that came out. Uh, they looked, they were all bent and curly. They looked like a potato chip, but they hadn't broken, you know, so it was a, it was a big, big win for them. Well, now after years of redesign and process tweaks, they now heat wafers to 900 degrees and bring them back down to room temperature in less than one one thousandth of a second. Can you believe that? Uh, it sounds impossible. I, you know, uh, uh, did to me anyway. But they showed me their data, and I got to believe them. I see the data. After that short anneal, the dopants are activated. They, uh, uh, you can see that the dopants are activated and that the uh, implant defects are gone. One one thousandth of a second, come on. <laughs> but hey, that's amazing, I think. Uh, now another rabbit out of the head is on photo. Uh, when we went from 248 well, well, we went when we went from the uh, 365 eye line resist to the 248 nanometer DPV light source. The DPV light source was 30 times dim dimmer than the previous uh, light source, and exposures were taking just a long, long time. Uh, so it really wasn't manufacturable. But then. These chemists, uh, a polymer chemist, Grant Wilson from IBM, and a couple other guys uh, from France, uh, they invented a chemically amplified photoresist that had over a hundredfold increase in light sensitivity. Fixed the problem, it was gone. I thought, uh, you know, <laughs> we were at a standstill, but not. The difference is uh, the old photoresist on 365 nanometer, you have an acid group with a photoactive. Uh, 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 group attached to it. And uh, when you hit that photoactive group with a, a photon, it releases the acid. And the acid changes the uh, photopolymer from being insoluble to being soluble. Well, what they did is they strung together a whole bunch of acid groups in a polymer and put a cap on it and then put a photoactive uh, molecule on the end of the cap. When you hit that thing with a, a photon, it releases the cap, and this polymer unzips, and it releases thousands of acids. Uh, so from one photon on their chemically amplified resist, from one photon, you get thousands of acid groups. So you don't need that intensive light anymore. You know, really cool. Uh, another crisis averted. Um, optical proximity corrections. Yeah, when work started on 250 nanometer node in about 97, the size of the geometries were about 250 nanometers. So the light wavelength was about the same size as the uh, uh, geometries that you're printing. And when that, when you get that small, uh, what happens is that the uh, uh, light interference effects will cause the geometries to print distorted, so you don't get on the wafer what you had on the reticle. So you put the perfect geometry on the reticle, and it ends up being distorted when you print it on the wafer. So what did these guys do? They 
Some of these uh, physicists and computer scientists, they wrote unbelievably complicated programs with uh, optical physics equations. And what they did is they calculated how to deform the patterns on the photomass in just the right way. So when light effect, interference effects got added, you ended up with the pattern that you really wanted. So the, the reticle, the patterns on the reticle look distorted and weird, but you end up getting what you want on the wafer. That's cool. <laughs> they, uh, and, oh, wait a minute, yeah, so. They also added what are called uh, SRAFs or sub-resolution figures. So the de designers wanted this on their wafer. And uh, they wrote a program so it would distort these geometries and they'd end up looking like they are here so that when you uh, printed those, you'd get this on the wafer. But that didn't completely work right. As you can see here, here's a reticle where they have their OPC corrections. I mean, this is a, a, a wafer that was printed with their OPC corrections, but they didn't have these. These are called SRAS or sub resolution assist features. These things are lines that are so small that they don't print. Uh, they're on the reticle, but they don't end up being on the wafer. And uh, you can see without these, sub-resolution figures. You got bridging here, and you have here a little geometry that's there that you don't want. Put in these uh, uh, yellow type sub-resolution figures. They don't print, but you end up on the wafer with pretty much what you wanted. Pretty cool. Uh, I think I've gone about long enough. <laughs> so there's uh, uh, another one that was amazing is the immersion uh, 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 lithography. Um, uh, just that they had planned to go to 157 nanometer uh, after the uh, uh, 193, and they couldn't do it. They tried for years and years and wasted billions and billions of dollars and finally just had to chunk the 150 all together. And, uh, but uh, ASML saved the day by coming up with immersion lithography. And, uh, uh, but anyway, so instead of the 157, they switched over and, and uh, went to immersion lithography. But uh, we'll just skip that. Uh, this is amazing. I, I thought we'd have to end uh, when Geometries got so small that we couldn't see them anymore. We didn't have the high enough magnification, but the uh, you know scientists and engineers kept one step ahead of us, inventing higher and higher magnification. Uh, here is a picture of a surface of a silicon crystal where you're looking at silicon atoms. Come on, I never thought that we'd be able to do that. That is just amazing. And here you can see where one of the silicon atoms is missing. Crazy. Oh. Anyway, oh, well, I tried to give you an idea of how transistors and IC chips are built. Uh, also uh, show you how a constant stream of inventions was needed in order to keep Moore's law on track. There's just so much more, we just barely, uh, scratch the surface. I also presented why, in my opinion, TI burst the semiconductor industry and why, in my opinion, Jack Kilby invented the integrated circuit, but uh, you must take into account I did work at TI and I did know Jack Kilby, so yeah, maybe I'm a little biased, but I don't think so. <laughs> but, so Tom, if, Anybody has any questions? I know I've gone a bit long. But. I'm going to ask the first two questions. <clears throat> Mr. Eric Johnson once told me the secret, a secret to TI success was this. The women who made the semiconductors. None of this work could have happened without the women. And in 1958, when the plant opened in Richardson, it gave employment opportunities to women here in um, Allen, McKinney, Plano, and they were all marveled at 
the patience these people had. And I said women because none of the men had the patience. It was the women. Men didn't sign up for this job. And women would be under these microscopes all day. And uh, I just find that absolutely amazing. And one of the other secrets to TI success, Mr. Eric Johnson told the women, if you have an idea to make this better, let us know. He'd sit down there in the factory with them. And they came up with great ideas. Anyways, that's, that's one of the secrets to TI success. The next slide. Now, I'm going to put you on the spot, Dr. Tigler. Uh, I had the blessing of knowing Dr. Gordon Peaty, Dr. Gordon Teal, Dr. Kilby, and so forth. And the list is so long, Dr. List, uh, I could, the list is so long. Now I know Dr. Tigler. It would take me all night to go through all the names. But this is what Tom remembered about these men. They were all creative, inquisitive, curious. They thought outside the box. They were intuitive. They were passionate, and they took risk. Dr. Tigler, how does that describe you? Me? <laughs> well, I think I had a few of them, but uh, I hope anyway. Yeah, I'm pretty passionate. Take a risk at a time. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. Other guys out here know, know me, and they probably are Well, for example, Pat Haggerty was, was an art expert. He had... Um, he was curious about other things besides engineering. He had a deep passion for uh, Mr. McDermott had uh, a lot of pursuits, and so did Mr. Johnson. Now, questions, comments, protests. Uh, you can say what you want. This is the library. I want your feedback. This is, don't be bashful. Give your feedback. And it's okay to brag. Howard. Hold on. Yeah. Howard. Howard. So where the heck are we going to now? We've got to be stuck here. Every, TSMC, it used to be 20 different country, companies were doing it here. Now it's TSMC and Sinchu and Tainan, now Taichung. Uh, where sure. are we going to? <laughs> where's, are we, where's who going to? Where's the whole semiconductor industry going to in Moore's Law? Where is the next generation coming from and where is it going to be built? You don't ask easy questions. Yeah. I really don't know. There, there are, uh, there's papers out there, you know, almost weekly or so uh, of new materials and stuff that uh, are com completely different, new transistor structures and that, that promise to have uh, uh, terabytes of uh, memory and go three times or or no, 30 times as fast or something as a transistor do now. I don't know. I I, I never thought we would get uh, below about 20 microns or something like that. I was completely wrong. <laughs> you know, I, I never guessed that. Uh, they get, I, I was, you know, I would think that uh, when transistors got so small that uh, uh, they acted more like dimmer switches than uh, on-off switches that uh, that would be a huge problem, but it doesn't seem to bother them at all. Before I entertain the questions, are there any of those women that were making the chips, are there any of them in the house tonight? Will you stand? <laughs> Part of CI success, right there. Okay, question. I have a comment for Dwayne's thing and a question. They're making molybdenum disilicide to replace the silicon under the gate, the channel, and that'll produce a trillion transistors. Some university in uh, Berlin in Germany is doing that, and I'm helping consult for them to build a tool to do that. That's what they're doing today. So that's one thing. How, how would one comment about the slide? The technology has gone to EUV, which costs about $150 million a piece. We do it on seven pattern layers. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, the, <coughs> the fab costs an order of $17 billion for a 50,000 wafers a month fab. So my question is, you all produce a silicon a transistor in three days at MMST. 
what the heck happened and why aren't we doing it today? Now it takes us 90 days to go from beginning to the end. And the amount of money that comes out of it is a savings of about six to eight million dollars a day. So if we can build the entire transistor in three days or one day a week, huh? that's trillions of dollars more. Well, well back then it was, uh, they were building them uh, double level metal, you know, they weren't putting uh, as many uh, layers on uh, or making them as, as small and that, but I really do think that, uh, uh, you know, there could be a, a lot, of, there are cheaper ways of doing it and uh, that we don't, I agree with you. I think that, uh, you know, we could make uh, transistors faster and uh, like, uh, um, oh, Put sensors on tools so you don't have to do uh, uh, inspections afterwards. Get rid of inspections and do it all with in situ uh, uh, sensors and that. Uh, I think there's st uh, still low hanging fruit that can be done to uh, make transistors. If, if you got rid of uh, uh, a lot of uh, you know inspection steps and that, you wouldn't have to. That would save a lot of time and move things faster. And boy, time sure is money when you're. Uh, uh, making transistors. Having retired in 1997, things have changed significantly. My question is, is are we going to run out of capability with silicon, so we're going to have to go to another base material? I I don't know. I, I, I think for, you know, the really uh, high performance stuff, uh, I, AI, you know, with maybe trillions of transistors on a chip and stuff like that, uh, maybe they'll go to another base material and stuff like uh, Patrick is uh, talking about. But I still think sil silicon has a lot of legs. I think it's going to be gone for quite a while. Uh, you know, analog chips and that don't have to be as small and fast as the uh, uh, CMOS chips uh, 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 that they use for uh, micro or, or for uh, yeah microprocessors and computer chips and stuff like that. Uh, I, I think I think sil silicon is going to be around for for a long while. <laughs> I was part of the group that started the MOS activity at TI. Congratulations. <laughs> and it was done as a classified program, which was very interesting to get it done because you had to account for every piece of silicon that shattered <laughs> on when you were processing it because there was very classified information in that circuit. So my, my question is, is, is bipolar still around? Oh, very much so, yeah, yeah. So, so TI is still making bipolar chips. And by CMOS, yeah. When I'm not, I want to stay away from the CMOS, just okay. the bipolar. Just bipolar? Yeah. Uh, boy, I wish, uh, 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 Bob Doring was here, but uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, uh, bipolar is still around. And I, I know uh, TI is now making uh, switches that, you know, are in the thousands of volts and stuff. And I don't know how many amps they know how to handle now. Right. But, but this, I was talking about the, like the TTL transistor, transistor logic that was the mainstream of the business many uh, years ago. Yeah, I, I don't know, Bill. Uh, okay. Uh, maybe there's someone else. There's a lot of people in this room that know a lot of stuff. So, Anybody know the answer or comment on his question? He does. Okay. Uh, and six inch and so on, they're making uh, uh, discrete devices that use bipolar transistors. And they're mostly going to come up in India. So India is going to be quite a big country if they succeed. U.S. has fallen behind because of the cost, yield. Yield always in this country is lower than the Far East. So we always lose out to Qualcomm and all that. They send the business there. 
If India can succeed there, then the chips will be much cheaper than the Taiwanese chip. But it's not easy to build a fam. So, yeah. Okay, in the back. So on leaving silicon, the RF power amplifiers have already gone or are in the process, you know, they went gallium arsenide in their process, in the process of going to gallium on silicon carbide. When you have power FETs, those have, you know, they're expected that one fourth of the market by 2030 will be wide band gap. So it'll either be gallium nitride or silicon carbide. So there's a chunk of the market that's already gone away from silicon. With the respect to bipolar, obviously bipolar components exist in analog mixed signal types of technologies, but for discrete bipolar, there's definitely a market of discrete bipolar, but that's not what TI makes and hasn't in years. Thanks. Comments? That, that was a, thank you for that assessment. Questions, protest? Your last chance to be with an expert. I, you know, I don't know, uh, but looking at uh, uh, using Wiki, Google, and uh, Bing, and those other search engines on there, I am really rather disappointed in, in Wiki. There's uh, a lot of misinformation, I would think, on there, especially about, about TI. Uh, I, I'm surprised that, uh, I don't know if it's uh, TI's marketing or, or, or who, you know, would be responsible for that sort of stuff. But, uh, uh, well, there's no policing. Well, yeah. I take that back. There's nobody that facts checks when they put it on Wikipedia, except for other people who read it. And, in, 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 uh, you know, on, on some of the Wiki pages and that, uh, you wouldn't even know that TI was involved in the semiconductors. I mean, they're just not mentioned at all. You look at, uh, read the uh, wiki write-up, you know, it's pages and pages in Silicon Valley. I mean, you hear a lot about uh, uh, Fairchild and some of the other companies, not a word about TI. Come on, you know? And, and they, they say they're talking about uh, silicon and silicon transistors, and they talk about you know how much they contributed to it and see and they did I mean Fa Fa uh, Fairchild continue contributed a lot to moss and CMOS transistors and that but silicon transistors I mean TI was so heavily into that stuff and was a sole supplier for years and years and yet not a word <laughs> what you just said how does this fit into their formula of what they did I mean I'm, I'm still looking from a kind of a psychological point of view. The, the, what you just described tonight was absolutely miraculous, beyond any expectation. Thank you. What did, if you were to put one word to that miracle, what would it be? <laughs> I don't know. I worked at it for, uh, you know, uh, for TI over 26 years, and a bunch of the stuff that I saw every day there when I stood, stepped back and thought about it, you know, kind of using my common sense, it's mind boggling. This stuff shouldn't work. This is crazy. You know, this, this is just, I mean, it shouldn't work, but it does. I know it does, and I know how it does, but it's still hard to believe. <laughs> One last question, comment, protest. Uh, yes, sir. No, no, I gotta have it in the mind. So your point on uh, Kilby, uh, whether he invented the integrated circuit, who won the Nobel Prize for that? You're right. <laughs> the, the, the Nobel uh, Committee got it right. They looked and they saw on, uh, oh, and that, <clears throat> that quote that I got was uh, taken from that book that was written by the Stanford professor and University of Illinois professor. So, and in that book, they had a picture of the page out of Jack Kilby's notebook uh, on that date, and it was signed by uh, you know some of his people. So uh, uh, that's real. I want to close with a little story. 
that all of TIers can be proud of uh, in one way or in the other. Um, father accompanied Dr. Kilby and Pat Haggerty and several others in 1961 to uh, Washington, D.C. to meet with the Defense Department. And of course, their object was to sell their product. They did not, these are brilliant scientists. Dr. Edward Teller was in on the committee, or, or the participated. They were so shocked, and this is 1961, at what T.I. had done, they didn't believe them. Hmm. They said, you're gonna have to prove this. There's no way. So I can appreciate all the, over the years, people saying there's no way this can be done. They were saying that in 1961. Wow. And the object then, as I recall the story from my father, American missiles were only, you could send out like 100 and maybe one would mit, get their target. And with the semiconductor, at the time, this is 1961, the accuracy was up to 50 feet. And they didn't believe them. And they said, within 20 years, we can have the accuracy within an inch. They didn't believe them. And they didn't know those TI engineers. <laughs> And I want to know how many of y'all are here tonight. Any of the any former, current TI engineers, would y'all stand? Go ahead and stand. Current, former TI engineers. <laughs> Our country owes so much to you guys and to those ladies who were on the belts making those things. And thank you all so much for what yep. you've done for our country and for the world. You've made it a better place to live. Thank you.